Here's James Wang in Taipei to tell us more. We are already seeing how people interact with technology in new ways. We call them accessories, and they come in many different form factors, including wearable devices, such as bands to be worn on the wrist, eyewear, and devices in clothing. But accessories don't stop there. Basketballs, bathroom scales, and pianos can all interact with an application on a smartphone or a tablet. Applications have emerged as the accelerator of current industry transitions. We've moved beyond the days of large code bases and years of software development. Instead, we now have the possibility of turning out multi-platform ready apps in weeks or even days. By focusing on user experience, millions of app developers have revolutionized how we launch and measure new functionality. The games industry has shown us the possibilities of turning out frequent, almost real-time updates to millions of users. Both are significant trends, they demonstrate that this generation of developers are tooled up to help businesses target micro-segments with frequent updates in functionality and performance upgrades if necessary. High-performance networks delivered in new innovative ways like utility models and API orchestration capabilities will become prerequisites. Brand risk associated with any downtime will drive new thinking around business continuity. We'll also see radical transitions in how IT users seek help with self-service becoming more important. Security concerns are rightly gaining more management attention. Enterprise policy development require expertise and the widening proliferation of IT enablements, a more integrated approach to security is needed. However, the most dramatic recent developments have been around state surveillance programs, with businesses re-examining their obligations to customers. The 嗯，随着越来越多的科技产品，是进入了企业的一个工作流程。we see vendors today diversifying their technology portfolio, particularly as their core lines of business start to show limited growth opportunities. They want their partners to come with them on this journey, incentivize their partners to take on more areas of their technology portfolio, and demonstrate their skill sets predominantly through specializations. This is one way in which we're seeing partner programs changing today. And there you have it. Innovation by the technology industry is driving better ways for us all to use devices and software. Businesses are spending more in technology, but in different ways. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Canales Channels Forum. I have the next 45 minutes to talk to you about the transitions in the IT industry. I also hope over the next two days, we'll show you what a fabulous city Bangkok is, and we have lots of entertainment and highlights, especially this evening. So our goals are to talk to you about the trends in the industry and show you that this is a great city. For the last three years, when I've had to give presentations, the number one topic that you've told us you're concerned about is the economy. I'm pleased to come to you today, and the quick poll just showed it. I'm pleased to come here today to say the economic crisis is over. That doesn't mean that economic performance is fantastic, but the period of crisis is over, and we expect more stability in economies around the world in 2014. Economy should no longer be your number one issue, which is good news from my point of view, because it means I have to spend much less time talking about the economy than in the past. Yes, Q4 will be hurt by the problems in the US government and the federal shutdown. So Q4, we were very optimistic about. Well, we've had to temper that a little bit. China had a difficult spring, Q April, May, June. But since then, has come on again much stronger, as has Thailand, by the way, also a slowdown and has now started to recover pretty strongly. So we are seeing overall the economic situation should no longer be a list of your top five priorities. However, I am going to talk to you about how quickly this industry is changing. I'm going to present some bad news to you. For businesses who don't change, it could be really bad news. And then as the presentation goes on, I'm also going to present to you many, many opportunities for those of you who are fast enough, brave enough to go to where the industry is heading rather than stay when it's passed. 
And this will be the first presentation I've ever given that has both sex and politics. Now you have to keep concentrating because the sex and politics come near the end. So I've talked to you about the economy. What we do is also we track the performance of the major technology vendors. We put them in a group, we average up their revenues, we call it our Titans Index, and it gives us a proxy for how the overall industry is performing. And while the economy has started to improve, the picture for those companies who serve you, the big technology vendors, has considerably slowed during 2011, 2012, and now into 2013. This is a sign of the need for an industry in transition to change. So we've been a little bit disappointed, but uh, most of our vendors have been a little bit disappointed. The channel is doing better than the vendors because you make money, so much money, out of serving the install base. But nevertheless, we've just got the Q3 results in really over overnight, as we saw results come out from the likes of EMC and SAP here. You see it's essentially flat around the 4 to 5% line. Now, I'll give you a bit more detail on those slides. And we split the data into software, smart devices, and infrastructure. And when we first drew this slide, I was really surprised. Because you'd think, from all the talk about the PC industry in crisis, that that would be the slowest performing part of the industry. But it isn't. Because the success of the smartphone industry in 2011, 2012, 2013 contributed massive revenues growth into the technology industry. So as the Wintel PC industry slowed, the smartphone industry has exploded, as well as help from tablets. And obviously, Samsung and Apple were the biggest beneficiaries of that. The software market has been steady, while infrastructure and services has really suffered from a slowdown in spending, both in government spending and financial spending. We are optimistic, as the economy stabilizes and improves, that we will see more expenditure and replacement cycles in infrastructure in 2014. As I start to move through the transitions, I'm going to give you some key statements. We're going to start with client computing and then move into infrastructure and enterprise computing. This year, in 2013, around the globe, the PC market will grow around 5.5%. But the PC market has been transformed by the arrival of the tablets. And during 2013, this year, around the world, 35% of the market is now in the tablet for format. 43% notebooks, 22% desktops. We are expecting in the fourth quarter of this year, tablets to outsell notebooks for the first time ever around the world. We are also expecting, be careful, a huge inventory buildup in tablets in Q4, particularly low-cost Android tablets and then a real fire sale and possibly some disasters in January, February, as vendors and channels have to get moved through the, some of those products. So be careful on your inventory levels of tablets. Nevertheless, this is a transformational moment for the client computing market. But this is not the only transformation. The arrival of mobility is also seeing us move from wired networks to wireless networks. It's seen the uptake in developed markets of 4G. We've seen the arrival of flash storage We've seen the arrival of ARM-based servers putting Intel under real pressure. We're seeing server market go to white boxes, particularly in hyperscale environments. And we're seeing all of this energy become ever more important and become a bigger and bigger issue for the technology industry. As we're consuming more energy, the price of energy is a real concern. The US has a real competitive advantage over most countries in Asia and most countries in Europe because of the arrival of shale gas and the low, low price of energy now in the US compared with elsewhere. That is a big advantage also to the data center industry. In terms of operating system formats, now looking at PCs and smartphones together, all in one group for 2013 around the world, you'll also see a transformation. Google, Google well, Android will take 57% of all shipments. Now, Android was a product launched around five years ago. This is transformational. Windows, 23%. And despite all the success that you read about from Apple, Apple is now down to a mere 17%. If Apple continues with its high pricing strategy, it is going to lose the market. It feels very much like 
a repeat of the Windows versus Mac battle of 20 years ago, where the Mac may have been the best product, but Windows was more competitive, faster, and took the market away from Apple. There's no sign yet that they are prepared to respond. And the iPad announcement last night saw the price of the iPad mini go up, although the, and the price of the old iPad mini go down by a mere $30. The 5C that they launched one month ago has not sold in the volumes expected simply because it's too expensive. So Apple has some challenges. The traditional PC vendors are challenged by this transformation. The tablet market obviously being led by the likes of Apple, by Amazon, by Samsung, and others. The traditional PC vendors, there are simply too many tier one vendors. And we would expect significant consolidation of the PC industry to happen over the next 12 months. Maybe around um, geographic lines where the Japanese get together, the Taiwanese get together, maybe some of the Americans get together. So look out for consolidation inside the PC industry. And if you take anything away from this slide, the most important thing is the importance of mobility. We are all running mobile businesses now. You need to think mobile first in every single thing you do. And I'll give you more and more examples as we go forward. As the industry starts to change and we move on to focus on the enterprise side of things, something else has happened. Four companies have emerged in the technology industry, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google, consumer-facing, that have achieved absolutely fantastic growth. These four companies together have grown 320% over the last five years. And I said I would present some not good news messages to you. The problem with these companies is they are not channel friendly. They do work with you if they need to, but they would much rather sell direct and cut you out. This has not been a good development for each of us. We haven't been able to benefit as a channel industry. Meanwhile, what we're seeing is change inside what is we call the traditional IT industry. If we look at all those big titans and we put them together, over the last five years, they've achieved revenue growth of only 15% between them. Not 15% per year, 15% in total. The consequence of that lack of growth means that we're seeing more and more of the big vendors move into each other's territory as they look for growth. And I'm going to take you through how that in industry is now reshaping. It was difficult to know where to start with this diagram, but we started with Microsoft, and we witnessed how Microsoft has made an attack on VMware with its virtualization uh, strategy inside Server 2012, particularly in emerging markets, particularly in new installations, coming from nowhere in this business to put VMware under real pressure and take some of the growth away from what VMware had been achieving, also pricing pressure on VMware. So we see Microsoft going after virtualization. We also see Microsoft going after some of Cisco's business with its very successful move in, with Skype and Link together, putting voice into the software applications market and moving in on Cisco. Meanwhile, Cisco and VMware have partnered closely together for many years, but VMware bought a company called Nicira at the end of last year moving into the software-defined networking space and, and challenging a little bit Cisco's poor, poor business. Since then, VMware has launched NSX, a set of standards around software-defined networking that Juniper is supporting, that Dell is supporting, that HP is supporting, and at least so far, Cisco is not supporting. So we see VMware moving into the Cisco space. Cisco's made some moves of its own. It's become more friendly with Citrix, and recently acquired a company called Whiptail in the flash storage space, taking a prod against its long-term partner, EMC, who we'll hear from shortly. VMware is making moves of its own towards automating the data center and launching its own cloud services, which I'll come back to. And in that, even making moves a little bit against its parent company, EMC, and we'll hear more on that topic too. EMC has set up a unique in, in, uh, a unique structure with the way of owning separate companies, including VMware and Pivotal, allowing itself to have competition internally in a unique way that no other vendor has done in our industry, and probably more likely to prevent itself from the innovator's dilemma than anybody else. So far, so good, but interesting the way those dynamics are playing out. 
Meanwhile, Cisco, of course, made a huge move against HP and IBM when it decided to go into servers and go after the data center market. It damaged those long-term relationships that it had with IBM and HP, putting more dependency on the channel and moving after HP. Oracle, of course, went into hardware. And of all the different examples I'm going to talk about, Oracle's move into hardware is the least successful, declining year on year in its hardware business. And most of you who are working with Oracle in the hardware have seen that business decline and you've moved away from Oracle. They made the move so far, it hasn't paid off. And obviously, it too damaged its relationship to HP. And then, of course, in another huge move, Microsoft decided to become a devices company, launching the Surfaces, the Windows tablets moving against its longtime partners in the PC industry, including HP. And of course, Microsoft's now extended that move with the proposed acquisition of Nokia, taking it directly into the phone market. So Microsoft moving into the devices market. And HP has responded by launching Android tablets, by launching Chromebooks, and by launching Google Apps for business on a PC bundle. So we see long-term relationships there more tense than they have been ever before. And then we have some companies on the side of this chart who haven't yet made a direct move against one of their long-term partners. But they each have challenges. Intel missed the shift to mobility, and missed the shift to smartphones and to tablets. Intel suffered from the innovator's dilemma. It thought it only had to deliver poor performance. And suddenly the market changed to a market that requires long battery life, low, low power, and low-cost prices and, and smaller processors. And it's been overtaken in the race by ARM. Intel's new management is trying to leapfrog the mobility space and move into the wearable space. And we'll have to see how successful that is. IBM has been very successful in the cloud, in security, in memory databases and analytics. But it misses the mid-market. And recently, it's made a move to go back into the mid-market more aggressively by putting all its hardware business 100% to the channel a move it probably should have made some time ago and much needs in order to turn that business around. Dell missed mobility and instead has focused this year on fighting a price war in the run-up to its privatization. Now it's private, we'll have to see how the strategy changes. We would expect them to focus more on cash flow and paying down the debts once that privatization is complete. SAP blindsided Oracle with the launch of its HANA database, in-memory databases, some two years ago. A major technology transformation of its own and done very well. SAP has been the fastest growing of the major technology titans over the last couple of years, although it has slowed a little bit in the last quarter, making numerous acquisitions in the cloud, including success factors. And Lenovo has done extraordinarily well in China. It's done well in the PC market around the world. It's a top five smartphone player in China but it's very exposed to its core business. And we would look to Lenovo to make acquisitions within the next six months in the smartphone space, possibly in the PC space, and possibly in the server space. So look for Lenovo to make some big moves. Now, what is driving all this change is a change in structure, a change in transition in the industry, the move to cloud. And in the cloud, something extraordinary has happened, a bookseller has dominated the market to date. This is a picture of the market share of infrastructure as a service for Amazon Web Services compared with the next top five vendors put together. And you see how Amazon is growing very fast, 63%. It will do $3.8 billion in cloud services this year. The next five together will only do $2.4 billion. Amazon's success is changing the dynamics of the enterprise infrastructure company as everybody feels the need to respond. But be very careful, because Amazon's revenue growth is tremendously impressive. But it is not profitable in this business, nor is anybody else that we believe. So it's moving. The growth is there. It's not yet a good business to be in. And what we've seen is, is some panic, I have to say, from all of the people who are now in the space of trying to catch up with Amazon. Most recently, VMware making the decision to go into cloud services itself rather than partner because it felt its partners, the cloud service providers, the telcos, simply were moving too slowly for it to keep up the pace in terms of competing with Amazon services. So VMware has now launched the vCloud hybrid service 
to compete directly with Amazon Web Services. But whatever they do, they need to change that name. A vCloud hybrid service, a real tongue twister. If they're going to lead out into the consumers and generate real demand, they need a better name. IBM is following. HP, Microsoft with Azure, and Google Compute Engine, all going after this business. But already, infrastructure as a service is commoditized, competitive, and around the world, we have too much capacity. They're underutilized, and they're not profitable. The cloud service provision market is transforming itself from specialized components to commodity components, to open source software. We're seeing a devastating cost curve. So the data center of three years ago is hugely expensive to the data center before. And we have started to see some notable back bankruptcies in the cloud service provider, including a provider in the US called Novanix and a company in the UK called 2E2. Both gone background on, the, on their rush to the cloud, their lack of profitability, their lack of utilization of the data center. There will be more. It is not possible for an industry to grow at this rate without profits and for everyone to survive. What are the responses? Some of the responses of some of the cloud providers, we're seeing IBM move in this direction, for example, is to move up the stack to try and build greater value than commoditized infrastructure as a services. One of the concepts that looks very interesting is community clouds, where you set up a cloud for one infrastructure, for one industry, that meets the financial requirements and regulation requirements of, of an industry that you're working with. And then you can offer that service to a number of uh, participants in that industry with the compliance issues taken care of. We're seeing that happen in Wall Street, for example. And EMC has some interesting community cloud stories. We're also seeing some of the infrastructure as a service vendors trying to partner with the software as a service vendors and package those services together to rise up the stack and build through software as a service sustained differentiation. Something else has happened. When this market started, the cloud service position market was a direct sale. They didn't need you guys. That is changing. And the cloud service providers have discovered if they want to reach small and medium businesses around the world, they need the channel. So we're seeing them swing back Equidix, for example, launching channel partner programs. And one of the takeaways from this conference is you can go away and sign up with cloud service provision companies. They've taken the financial risk. You're just getting a cut. And we expect that business to be significant growth for you. I said I was going to talk about politics in this presentation. One of the biggest things, in, impacts of what's happened in our industry this year is the revelations from Edward Snowden that have been leaked around what's been happening in terms of the NSA and PRISM. When we surveyed you before this conference, around one third of you were not aware of these allegations. And the allegations are simply that cloud service providers have been sharing data unwillingly, but being forced to share data with the security services in the US and maybe elsewhere in great detail and at high volumes. This will have an impact on cloud provision services. And we see the impact in three ways as companies try and protect themselves from this, this spying that's going on. And we see three things emerging. One is there will be a bigger push to better encryption services. So there's a company called Lockbox, for example, that will encrypt your files on your PC before they go to their cloud, store them in the cloud, and at least supposedly, it's claimed nobody can unencrypt the, the data that you have hosted on their servers in the cloud. So encrypt locally before the transfer rather than encrypt on the server. server. That's something that Lockbox is doing. There's a search engine doing very well in the last six months called DuckDuckGo, giving competition to Google and, and Bing. And the reason why they're doing well is they don't store your search history. So they can't share anything. They can't share any data because they're not storing it. And it's seeing massive growth. So we expect to see better encryption and privacy solutions from some of the providers. We would also expect in the cloud a move towards open source. If software is open source, then if it's being hacked or if there is a spying backdoor in the software, everyone will know about it. You may not be able to stop it, but at least it will be public and shared. And we're seeing moves now around OpenStack into the cloud that could give some protection around this. 
And perhaps the biggest implication of what we've seen is we would expect cloud computing to become more local. More and more companies insisting that their data is guaranteed to be kept in their country. So at least they know the regulatory environment that they're working in. They know what laws and risks they are taking. And we're seeing some countries lead this initiative, two in particular. So Brazil is discussing whether to put in legislation that will demand that any service provider operating in Brazil has to have servers in the country. Brazil is also talking about building new cables around the world so that it can route internet traffic around the world and not into the US, bypassing the US. And in Germany, a country that takes privacy and security very strongly, we've seen their lead telecom company, Deutsche Telekom, decide to launch an email service called Made in Germany. And they guarantee that if two of their customers are exchanging emails between each other in Germany, it does not pass the US and cannot be, um, um, cannot be hacked in the US, cannot be spied on in the US. We will see more and more of these solutions. Cloud service providers will come local. We expect to see the multinationals, including our vendors here today, as well as the likes of Amazon, to have to establish data centers in each country and guarantee in some way this is certified that we are complying with the regulation in this country. If not, the market will become more local, which is, of course, all good news for channel partners, because you will be the ones at the forefront of providing local cloud solutions. And now I want to move on to what is the biggest transition that we see in the industry, and one that is fantastic news for Asia, particularly for the countries that have done so well in software development, India, Indonesia, um, Philippines. Every company will become a software company. Traditionally, we've seen thought of software and the kind of solutions we provide as operational, helping companies function, keeping their operations going, managing the finances, doing the ERP. And that business is, is steady and stable. But the exciting opportunities are now coming from different examples. The exciting opportunities are coming from using software to differentiate your product. Not selling software, but using software to differentiate your product, as well as using software to drive marketing and sales activity. The picture of this car in the middle is a Tesla S. A Tesla S is now the third best-selling luxury sedan in, in California. It's an all-electric car, but most importantly, it's the first software-defined car that the industry has ever seen. The Tesla S is transformational. We expect many of the traditional car companies, Hyundai or to Toyota or Kia or Volkswagen or General Motors, to suffer, suffer the same fate as the likes of Kodak did when digital photography took off. They will fail to become software companies and watch the industry transform around them. The Tesla car is, has a built-in SIM. So when the engineers do a software update, they can update all their customers' cars overnight. And recently, they did a software update that gave their, car, their electric cars 10% more distance overnight through an update overnight in the car by extending, I was improving the sleeping performance, the battery utilization, the sleeping mode of the car. That is transformational as an industry. So the car industry is becoming a software industry. But it's not just there. Federal Express, the parcel delivery company, has launched a program called SensorWare GPS. And what they can do is put sensors in their packages. And they can track those packages, obviously, where they are, share that information with their customers. But the sensors are becoming intelligent, so they can also say what temperature the parcel is at, what humidity the parcel is at, which is absolutely critical if you're in the medical industry and you're transporting goods, or if you're in the food industry and you're transforming goods. So Federal Express, a postal delivery company, is using software to differentiate and, and charge premium prices. One of our sponsors today, Schneider Electric, has run a worldwide marketing campaign talking about how they use software to better manage energy inside 
operations inside facilities, inside data centers, using software as their tool to save energy for their customers, using software to differentiate a traditional energy business. We will see transformations. What companies discover once they go down the software path is they get agility. Market research goes away, and instead you're able to test your software with your customers, use what's called A-B testing, put one version out to some set of customers, put another version out to another set of customers, see which one works. And they get the agility because instead of releasing software, say, every two years, as we did in the old world, what we're doing seeing is releases of every two months, for example. Transformational in terms of the speed companies are able to engage. Every company will become a software company. We have become a software company by making this event app-based and using the app to differentiate the services we offer in this, in this event. We think you need to think about how you partner with these companies, but also how you become software companies alone. Everything is becoming software. And with everything becoming software, everything is becoming digital too. We are slightly channel, challenged in the channel industry. Forgive me for this. But most of our audience are in our 40s and 50s. It is really important if you're the CEO of a company that you make sure you understand the digital revolution and the impact it's having on you and your customers. And if you don't, you should consider recruiting and appointing a chief digital officer as your deputy to make sure that your company is exploiting all the opportunities that you can. And digital skills are lacking. It is not easy to find these people. And we're seeing a shift in, in HR circles. In the classic technology industry, what we used to do was groom executives for 20, 30 years and give them jobs in finance, give them jobs in, uh, in sales, give them jobs in HR, give them a, a spell maybe in the legal department, build out a broad set of skills, and then when they're ready, say, great, you're now ready to be the CEO. Silicon Valley is changing that model. Silicon Valley is starting to say, no, we want spiky employees, employees who may, may not be rounded, may have significant personal weaknesses, but are experts in our product and are able to guide our digital strategy going forward. Obviously, Steve Jobs was spiky. Mark Zuckerberg's spiky. Marissa Meyer at Yahoo is spiky. None of these came from a classic CEO background, but they are product innovators in the digital world. And one of the most interesting things to watch over the next six months or so is when Microsoft announced a successor to Steve Barmer, do they go corporate or do they go spiky? As the Wall Street Journal has reported, that is a subject of discussion amongst their board members, and we'll have to look to see how that pans out. Obviously, Apple went consensus. They went corporate when Steve Jobs passed away and Tim Cook took over. And we have to see how that works. So far, Apple's been fairly stable, but not, not dramatic since Tim Cook took over. He is surrounded by spikes, the likes of Johnny Ive. He's surrounded by spikes. We'll have to see whether that model works. But they're under pressure as they go from that transition. And marketing is becoming digital everywhere. I'll give you one example of uh, something that happened recently between the UK and the US. One customer was flying on the British Airways. I think he was flying to Dubai. When he landed in Dubai, his luggage was lost. OK, that's happened to all of us. And when he went to the customer service desk and asked them to track the luggage, he had a really disappointing experience. I guess he was quite angry. Then he did something very interesting. He paid to put a tweet on Twitter, a promoted tweet. He targeted New York so that people woke up in New York and saw his complaint about British Airways. It cost around $1,000. And he did it in a time zone of the um, evening in the US when British Airways customer services is closed. They didn't respond until the next morning. By then, the tweet had gone, the tweet had gone viral. Everybody in New York and beyond knew about his story. And I'm sure he got his ba bag back the next day. But British Airways had not enabled their marketing to be 24 hours. They thought they could rely on a, a kind of nine to five service. We will see more and more companies getting caught out by this digital revolution and making marketing 
a part of your core strategy in the digital world is absolutely essential. And we're seeing the te technology vendors that you know make acquisitions in that space. So recently, Adobe bought Neolane, Salesforce bought Exact Target, and the advertising agency, WPP, has been buying up cloud providers in order to provide advertising services itself. Think about how your company can become more digital. Who is the digital expert? If you're still relying on printing out your appointments on paper, you're going to struggle to lead in this new generation of digital companies. And one of the reasons why spiky employees are beginning to succeed is because the way we communicate is changing significantly. The old methods that we used are dying out. Sadly, no one writes letters anymore. When was the last time you sent a fax? Voicemail, still in use, but in decline. Phone calls, is it now impolite to call someone if they're not expecting your call? SMS, telepresence has been significantly impacted by the arrival of Skype and video-based free services. Room-based telepresence services declined 34% in 2012, and we expect it to decline by another 13% this year. And even email coming under pressure. There's a consulting company called Atos that has a goal that by 2014, there will be no emails sent internally. For the first time, I'm meeting executives at some of the leading technology companies who put an auto-reply to all internal emails saying, please don't send me an email, contact me by some other means. Because email is a very inefficient way of communicating but compared with many of the modern tools that we have. And we put up here the range of ways we now communicate, whether that's through social networks, whether that's through blogs, whether that's through file sharing documents, um, through Line, which we're using to run this event, WeChat, etc., over the top services. So we're seeing a transformation. Now, something has happened, back to my earlier comment around politics. Something has happened. The old form of communications were all industry standards. No company owned them. The new ways we communicate are all owned by somebody. Different, people, different companies own different services. We've gone from industry standards to company-owned ways of communicating. It's a major transformation. Again, you have to keep up to date in how you're working with your customers and your suppliers in these services. I want to talk also about some of the opportunities. There's a lot of talk in the industry about wearable computing. We actually think a better term is accessories. And we're expecting an explosion in accessory services over the next two years. And this will be transformational. Yes, you are right to be skeptical of whether Google Glass will be a successful product. For us, it seems too nerdy, too weird to really make much traction beyond some niches. Likewise, many of the watches that have been launched so far from Samsung, from Sony, from Pebble, are disappointing today. And watches are a very personal fashion statement. And we're not sure they're going to go nerdy. We'll have to see how that market pays out. But there are areas where wearable computing will be an absolute certain hit. And again, this is every company becomes a software company. The biggest area of opportunity in accessories is probably around health and fitness. And I'm going to give you two examples which are so cast iron certainties of a transformation ahead that you'll probably remember only these from this presentation today. The first one is next year, a startup company will launch a wearable device for babies. And just think about what this device will do for babies. It will tell you their heart rate. It will tell you their temperature. It will tell you whether they're asleep or not. It will tell you whether they're crying or not. It will include a microphone so you can hear what's going on. And it will be controlled by your smartphone. So you can have your Nokia phone or your Apple phone anywhere in the world and know how your baby's doing. You can be pretty sure that middle class families around the world are going to rush to put wearable devices on their babies and make first time parenting, parenting much easier than it's ever been before. It's such an obvious hit. There are many other examples in the healthcare industry. Any patients with chronic diseases that, or, or the elderly tracking, tracking how they're doing, tracking they've woken up in the morning, etc. We'll see growth around remote home monitoring as well. 
surveillance and management in, in that space. A company called Shortel in the telephony space has launched a Shortel dock, so replacing their desktop phones with docking stations where you can put in your smartphone and your smartphone becomes your business phone and speaker phone when it's docked at the office, an accessory driven device again. But the other big example, which is where the sex comes in today, you will have all heard of the company Durex. Next year, I'm not joking, next year, Durex are launching a new product line. That product line is called Fundaware. F-U-N-D-A-W-E-A-R. It's an accessory. It's an app control device. And what Fundaware is, is vibrating underwear. <laughs> and you control it from an app. No, I haven't seen them. They haven't launched yet. This is next year, not this year. And of course, you can control your own underwear, or if they'll let you, someone else's underwear. If the sex industry is converging with the IT industry, and if the sex industry is becoming a software industry, please don't walk away from this conference thinking there aren't huge opportunities for head, ahead for us in every sector, whether it's health, fitness, whether it's the car industry, whether it's postal services, or any of the other examples that I've given you. It will be transformational. And interestingly, how does the channel benefit from this launch in wearable computing and accessories? We're not sure, because many of the services will be consumer and retail-led. There may be some specialist services in healthcare you can go after. But what, of course, the arrival of accessories will do is create masses of data. Masses and masses of data. And all of that data will need to be stored and managed somewhere. We are seeing their big vendors go after this space in great strength around analytics, most recently, IBM buying Trustier, SAP buying XN. And we're going to see an explosion of activity around analytics and big data. Our mind will boggle with all this information that we can have on babies and various other industries. So what we need to do as an industry is learn how to do big data projects. Last year was probably the, the first year of hype around big data. People started to realize the possibilities. Some big projects went ahead. This year, there is a bit more reality around big data because we've learned. We've got 12 months more of lear learning. Big data projects today often go wrong. And they go wrong for various reasons. Some of them are fixable, like the data quality isn't good enough. Abbreviations complicate things. They go wrong because people lack the expertise to do the inquiries and need training. And they go wrong because people use irrelevant data multi-sources that they are not relevant. If you're trying to fix your internal operations, you don't need the Twitter feed on your company. The customer service team needs that. So making sure you have the right data streams. Those are three common mistakes. But the bigger mistakes are that many analytics projects lack business objectives. Where does analytics sit inside an organization? Does it sit in the IT department, where they've probably got the technology skills to run a project? Does it sit in marketing? Does it sit in corporate strategy? We're not really sure, and it's not very clear where they should sit. It's very complicated for companies to manage. So the first thing you have to decide when you're undergoing projects around analytics and big data is what is our business objectives? But interestingly, the biggest challenge of all is something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a, a very famous psychological problem that even professors of statistics still get tricked by. And what confirmation bias tells us is we as human beings, even highly trained human beings, we look for the information that agrees with what we think. And if we find, a, we find information that does not agree with what we think, we say that must be rubbish, I'll ignore that, and focus on what we agree with. This is highly skilled psychological profiling and for people to understand what they can really do with this data. So we'll, there's a huge requirement of it, skills. If I had a child graduating from college in, in a maths type degree right now, I would be telling them go into this space. The, the big data scientists are going to be some of the most valuable employees, but those skills will be rare. If you can get them inside your company, go for it, and it's a highly trained 
new discipline emerging that I say is a challenge even for professionals in the statistics space. So think about how all this wearable computing is going to drive the arrival of big data, and then think how you can sensibly help your customers to move through that transition. And then I want to talk on my final slide today. I talked about every company will become a software company. This actually is a software, company, software example too. But it's also an example that the hardware industry does have a future. And one of the areas where it has a future is in 3D printing. Uh, the market is small, but the market it will double this year. And Microsoft, when they've launched Windows 8.1 a week or so ago, have included support for 3D printing for the first time. That's normally a key enabler of a take-up of an industry. I predict one of you will go away from this conference, start a business in 3D, 3D printing, and make at least a million dollars for yourself personally by going after this opportunity and being the expert in your region or in your country. All of the things on this slide have been printed on 3D printers. Guitars and musical instruments, hamburgers, guns, glasses, women's clothes, shoes, and even a human jaw, human jaw. The possibilities are endless. Yes, the, the products are expensive today, and they're unreliable today. We need a transformation in the technology, but it's happening and the cost curve will come to our advantage. 3D printing, the low end, can start at around $1,000. You can think of that as kind of an inkjet model, and that will be printing in plastic. The more sophisticated printers can print, and more expensive printers can print in rubber, in metal, and even in ceramics. There is even a project run at the Harvard Medical School to do 3D printing of human body parts. So if someone has an accident and they lose their ear, we'll be able to print new ears. Unbelievable, but true. But where is the opportunities for 3D printing in the short term? The best opportunity is in, in mini manufacturing sites for prototyping, experimentation. A bit like with printing, um, printing in the office versus printing off-site, 3D printing, it doesn't get cheaper. The cost per item is the same. So 3D printing today makes sense if you need to print one, two, three, ten items. 3D printing is very slow and very expensive if you want to print hundreds or thousands of items. So 3D printing will be for prototyping, so that engineers and designers can come up with concepts, design them, and, and, and outproduce a product. An example I want to give you of an industry that will be transformed is sunglasses. The possibilities with sunglasses are enormous. Today, you walk into a shop, you pick one off the shelf, and you put it, put it on. We see a future where sunglasses will be printed in 3D printers. That technology exists today. It's not economic, but it exists today. And you'll go into the shop, you'll look through the Gucci catalog, you'll look through the Prada catalog, you'll make your selection of which sunglasses you want, you'll choose the color maybe, design. Then the optician will use a 3D scanner to scan your head, decide the size of the sunglasses you need, and outprints customized sunglasses to meet your needs. This could be transformational. And remember, there's someone designing the software to do the scanning. There's a scanning machine involved. There's a printing machine involved. And then it gets even more interesting, because once you've got the, these designs of a Prada set of sunglasses, what's to stop those designs leaking? People printing them on their printers at home or, or in a shared service center somewhere. And how do companies protect their copyright? It's going to be very complicated. The sunglasses industry and many other industries will end up going through exactly what the music industry went through in terms of learning how to deal in this new environment. They may be able to do things which you see on some sports, um, sports shirts, for example, where the big sports clubs try and prove the authenticity of their shirts by putting chips inside. There may be authentic chips inside the approved sunglasses, so you can show these are genuine. Whether you care or not, and whether anyone can tell, I don't know. But we will see a revolution also in the legal rights in many of these industries. 
So that's one very big example of how the sunglasses industry can be transformed by 3D printing. There are many, many other examples. Now is the time to get those expertise. And for the channel, you can think about whether you want to, uh, for the channel, you can think about whether you want to get into the software skills and some of these specialist services, but you don't need to. This is a beautiful business for you because you can also sell the printer, network the printer, maintain the printer, and best of all, provide the consumables for the printer. It's a classic, beautiful channel opportunity which has plenty of growth behind it. If you look on Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a venture capital, self-crowdsourced venture capital site in the US, very popular in Silicon Valley. The best launches of companies in the technology industry in the last 12 months are all around 3D printing. Printers themselves, scanners, but even think about 3D pens, where you can sketch in plastic a 3D item as you design and produce a, a product customized. The opportunities are very exciting. We think you should be going after this, and we're encouraging our vendors to go after this. So it brings me to the end of this presentation. I've told you a lot of key things. I've told you no need to worry about the economy, OK? We're through the crisis. I've told you that the technology industry, the traditional technology industry, is struggling for growth. And we're seeing some changes as former partners go after each other. I've talked to you about the arrival of digital, digitalization everywhere, and mobility everywhere. And you'll need to look out for spiky employees. I've talked to you about 3D printing. I have talked to you about wearable computing. We're very sure that the opportunities for our industry are enormous. Let's go grab and take advantage of those opportunities. I wish you every success. And now I'd like to hand back to Rachel. Thank you.